right. Uh, up next, we have uh, Mark Bennett to give us an intro introduction to Graph GraphQL. Perfect. All right, welcome, Mark. Great. Thanks, everybody. Good to see everybody again. I just want to say thank you to Sean, too. I think he's doing an awesome job tonight with the MC. So, good job, Sean. Um, all right, so yeah, I'm here to talk to you guys about GraphQL. This is just a brief intro talk. So, just to give you guys a bit of what to expect, um, I guess first, I'm Mark Bennett. I'm a developer with Burma Studio, one of the people that helps organize this meetup. Um, this talk, it's going to be pretty tight on time, so we're going to save questions to the end. Uh, it should be about 10 minutes. After this is over, hopefully you have enough interest that we're going to have a hack up on the 18th where you can actually play with some of this stuff and actually use the code a bit. Um, and so you're encouraged to come out with your own projects there or there's a couple of things that you know, I would like to work on that we could work on together and learn a bit about maybe writing a GraphQL server, things like that. So uh, yeah, if you're keen on what we're doing here today, definitely put that in your calendars and find out that'll be a jobber uh, on October 18th. So if you want to, there are notes online. Uh, I will post that again at the end of this talk to you, so you don't have to write it down right now. So let's get started. So what is the problem that GraphQL is meant to address? Basically, oh, I guess my cute little emojis aren't there. How it works is that users like apps that are fast. We all use apps on our phone. We all use websites. It's annoying when they're slow. But there's a problem. Most of our data these days is remote. It's on slow networks. And that can make our apps seem slow and non-performant. So, in a nutshell, GraphQL is designed to use the network more efficiently. And by doing that, it allows our apps to be faster. So, users like GraphQL. Apps are faster. Yay! How it works is pretty simple. Um, we're going to imagine we have a really simple you know, view inside an app. We have a user named Alice. She's got a bunch of blog posts, a bunch of comments. She wants to pull those up on a dashboard or something. So if you were to go and do this right now, you'd probably be using a set of RESTful API endpoints. So they might look something like this, for example. We're going to retrieve the user. We're going to retrieve the set of her posts, a bunch of uh, comments for each post. Maybe we're going to retrieve details about the user associated with each comment. I figure you're going to be doing at least six HTTP calls to render this view. And so that's a lot of calls, maybe more than we need. And the calls themselves are not really that efficient. So if you look at it, we're going to break down the one to retrieve the user Alice. So here, in the UI, really all we're showing is Alice's name. But we're retrieving an entire set of data, stuff you know, about login, reputation, things that we're not going to use in this view of the app. So if you look at it, we're really looking for one field, and all of the rest of it is wasted memory, wasted bandwidth, wasted processing time and resources. So how does GraphQL solve this? Well, if we were working with a GraphQL endpoint, what we would do instead of doing that set of REST calls is we would write something called the GraphQL query. And I'll go into a bit more details later about how this actually works. But for now, you can kind of think of it as a JSON object, uh, but without any values. It just has keys that describe what you would like to get back. Uh, and then when you send that off to the endpoint, it's going to send back the values to you that go along to sort of build that JSON object. And the cool thing is that this is one HTTP call. So instead of doing six plus, we're doing a single HTTP call, uh, which on something like a mobile network can have pretty significant performance implications. Uh, and as well, one of the interesting things is more like a, a query language like SQL. As a user, we're going to describe exactly the data that we need. So just the data that we want comes back. There's no wasted data um, in terms of what's delivered to us uh, and anything extra to process, things like that. So there's a few other interesting things about this that I'll get to a bit later on as well. So what about developers? We know users like fast apps, but is there any reason why, as a developer, we might be interested in GraphQL? Well, the big thing is that developers, we want to be productive, right? We want to you know, be able to whip out apps and you know, get things deployed quickly and running smoothly. So, Right now, how many people here have worked with the REST API? I'm assuming pretty much everybody, right? So at least my experience is every time you're starting to use a new REST API, you're going, you're looking at their docs, you're looking at their examples. Um, and basically, as you go from one API to another, they're all unique. And even within them, uh, you know, they might have performance considerations or things like that. So the, the way you use the API, even within a single API, can be inconsistent. It's annoying. So as you know, uh, there's also no kind of accepted standard for describing how REST endpoints would work. 
So what this means is that there's been some attempts at things like this, but generally there's not much available in terms of tooling to help you access REST endpoints, uh, as well as things like type checking and things like that when you're querying against them. So the cool thing about GraphQL is that it includes a standard machine-readable data schema. So one of the parts of the GraphQL is a way to describe your data that you can use in your tools. Uh, another thing, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, is that you generally, when you're working on a large app, have a front-end team and a back-end team. So if you are you know, writing a new view on a front-end team, one of the first things you have to do is go in and define what you're going to need in terms of the data, and then ship that off to someone on the back-end who will make sure that you can get that data from the app. So every time you're changing the data you're requesting on the front end, there's usually going to be an associated change on the back end as well. So that means that you're tightly coupling, coupling your front end and back end team, which slows everybody down. So the cool thing about GraphQL is because it also describes a query language, you can use that query language and get a lot more data out of the same set of API endpoints. So it, uh, it can really reduce the amount of work that you have to do going back and forth between front and back end and devs. So this is all great, but I haven't really talked about what GraphQL actually is. At this point, you might have a sense of what you might use it for, but what is it? So essentially, all it is is a new data standard. So it's a way of describing a couple things. So it's going to describe that data schema, and it's going to describe a query language. So the data schema in and of itself is very interesting. Um, it's going to describe your data in terms of a bunch of different primitives. It's going to talk about things like basic types that you can define for your app. So in this case, we're going to be talking about Star Wars. Um, you'll see this example a lot in the GraphQL community too. So you know, we can describe things like a character type. Uh, we have enumerations. So in this case, we enumerate over the set of movies. Uh, we also have things like queries, which can describe how you can retrieve data from your model. And interestingly, we also have something called mutations that describe how you can change it. So together, these give you a, a kind of a sense of what's available, um, how you get the data out of the model, and how you can modify and change it. There's also other interesting things. They have uh, union types. Uh, they have interfaces. So you could have, let's say, you know, a hero and a spaceship and a robot are all characters. And so you know if you're dealing with a character, they'll have certain properties and things like that. Um, union types let you go and say have a, a, an interface that's going to return any of a set of different types and then you can have client code to work against that. One of the new things that uh, is in an RFC right now but has already been implemented by a couple of different libraries is subscriptions and so you can go and actually say that your data set exposes a, a subscription endpoint that you can then go and subscribe to a certain set of data and get updates in your client as it changes in real time. So, which is kind of cool. That's, that's pretty unique. So, as well as defining a, a schema, it also defines a query language. So, I've gone through here and um, basically tried to break out a couple simple examples. So, this is the most basic one I have. You have a, a query where we're saying we would like to retrieve a hero. We want to name uh, his set of friends and their names. So you can see it really does just look like a JSON object where we have keys and no values at its most simple. So if you were to run that, you would get back a response here where you get a JSON object with a field called data. And then you can see it's almost just taken what's on the left, populated it, and sent it back to you on the right. Okay. So getting a bit more complicated now, one of the things you'll see uh, if you're building any real apps is that you're going to start having a set of predefined queries that you're working with. So instead of having strings that you're parsing in a client and sending to the server, you can predefine uh, a certain set of queries with a certain set of arguments, uh, and then the query client can uh, optimize for that. There's also things like it can do uh, uh, escaping and things like that that you could write yourself in a string concatenation library, but most of the server or client side libraries, excuse me, will handle that themselves if you're dealing with stuff like user input, things like that. Um, and the cool thing too is that you can pass parameters into these queries, but a lot of fields in the model will also take arguments. So it's interesting, you'll see um, here, for example, we can say that we want a hero from a specific episode. So we can say we want um, the hero from uh, A New Hope, and then we would get back Luke Skywalker with all of his details there. Oh okay, yeah, just for those of you that haven't included an array, left side is the query, right side is the response from the server. 
Um, so that's great, but a lot, of, a lot of the times you're going to be having cases where you might want to go and use the same field a couple times in a query. So they have a concept of something called aliases. So you can go here and let's say we wanted to compare heroes from two different movies. So we can have a left comparison and a right comparison, and they're going to hit the same query on our data source, but come back with different names in the JSON we get back. So you can see here, left comparison, right comparison, and then we get left and right on the other side. Then my data coming back. Okay, you got cut off. Sorry about that. Um, so that's okay. Right now we only have two fields that we're pulling from, um, from the data set. We're getting names and which movie they appear in. But often you're going to be getting a lot more um, fields to show in the UI or something like that. So they actually have a concept that helps with that called fragments. So basically what you do here is, again, we can have the uh, left and right comparison aliases there. They're both going to hit the hero's uh, query to get back the hero of different episodes. But instead of having to retype all the fields, you can basically think of it using a fragment. It's almost like a, a little kind of nested um, snapshot of your query that you can just paste into other parts. So they're reusing it there. And uh, the nice thing, too, is that if you change that fragment, it'll update in the query as well. So just a nice little trick there for saving some time. So the query language itself isn't much more complicated than that. There are uh, a few other things you can do to define, uh, you know, if you're using a standard set of fields to query, um, you can go and define your own types in the client that you can reuse to do that. Um, that's something that we could get into with the hackathon. Maybe if you're interested in the hackup, excuse me. So one of the things, though, that's really confusing about GraphQL is a lot of people maybe have a sense of what GraphQL is, but struggle to figure out what GraphQL isn't. And this is an important distinction when you're talking about GraphQL. So it's not a library or a framework. What it is, it's, um, it's a standard, and there's a third-party ecosystem of front and back-end libraries that'll implement that. So there's reference implementations for uh, the client and server, which are, are available from Facebook. They're not actually the most popular ones and the back-end ones, depending on your language, you wouldn't ever use. You know, if you're using Ruby, for example, you wouldn't ever use the Facebook ones. Uh, so there's a whole set of them, and there are reference implementations, but um, they're not part of the spec itself. As well, and this is something that Sean uh, has done a bit of GraphQL, we were talking about this earlier. One of the, the places where the GraphQL protocol or spec stumbles a little bit, I think, is that it defines the schema and it defines this query language, but where it gets a little bit fuzzy is it has some recommendations for how the client and the server might talk to each other. But you'll see in that part of the spec, there's a lot of not required and suggested and things like that. Um, so they suggest you know, you're sending JSON over HTTP and have some examples of how you might do that. But it's designed so that it could work over all sorts of different protocols. And you know, there's things like error handling and edge cases that um, you'll definitely hit. Um, having said that, it does have a pretty robust uh, description of you know, different error cases and things like that. And they spec out how queries are parsed and um, lexed and all these different things. So th th it is a pretty comprehensive spec in and of itself. But this does seem like something where right now, without a protocol that they actually require people to use, you could have issues with different implementations working together. So, mm, yeah, JSON over HTTP is, the, is recommended but not required. So to wrap up, um, GraphQL uses the network more efficiently, and that makes your apps faster. Uh, writing your own queries and developers are more productive. And it's a specification with multiple implementations. Uh, just a reminder, there is a hack up October 18th. Uh, I can ask Sean if you want more details about that. Um, I will be there and we will be writing some kind of GraphQL. Uh, this is my contact details and the notes. And that's it. So, thank you. I don't know if there were any questions, I can try to answer them, but. I'm fairly new to graph, but help you. Uh, so when you talked about oh, sorry. Uh, the part that you talked about only covers sort of reading or getting or whatever you want to call it. Does the, pro, the does the specification, I guess, cover the you know put post? Yeah. Right so part here, I'll pull the, up the example here. One second, if I can get out of this. Oh, there we go. Okay, one second. So if you go to the GraphQL website. Um, 
Let's see if it comes up. So their documentation is actually cool because it has a bunch of different examples here where they actually go and you can use these. Ah, sorry. Can we click on it? <laughs> I don't know how I'm doing the three finger click. Um, there it's like we go. I push too hard. It is, yeah. Okay, the first touch. Um, yeah, so over here it's cool. So when you first come here, it might not be entirely evident, but they actually have um, live queries on the left here. So you can go like mutation, and then, oh, what's the shortcut? Yeah, so create review. Can you guys see that? I can make that bigger maybe. There we go. So this is just a little, it's actually a React component that they have, so it's really easy to embed in your things too. So create episode. Jedi, and then review, and I'm trying to remember the format for review. Let's just try this. It's awesome. All right, well, I'm not going to go through the whole thing right now because I can't get it um, Review is a type, and I'm missing some fields. Um, but you can see here, like it's actually telling me, when I hover over it, it should tell me that that is a type that I can use. I just don't know how to see the subfields on it. Um, another thing that's cool is there's um, something called GraphQL, um, or GraphQL Playground. And so one of the things that it has that this doesn't have embedded in it is the documentation on the right-hand side. So it has documentation that it generates from the schema. And uh, you'll actually see, too, if you use Facebook's reference implementation of um, the server for Express, like for Node, it has something called Graph EQL in it. Like it's like Graph and then I then EQL, and it basically embeds something much like this with the documentation there as well too. And so it would show like if, right now I'm struggling to remember what the fields are on a review, but it would actually show you like what a review is and tell you what the fields are. Cool. This isn't really a question, but it kind of deals a little bit with the way, the way mutations and queries work, is I found it really helpful to think about GraphQL as a functional query language. It's almost as though you're dealing with, I don't know if you're familiar with Rails, how does active record, like you're basically saying, hey, give me data, describe what you want, and if you want to change something, it's like, I don't know, set the name of model ID to Bob, um, versus what you're thinking about with, with uh, REST, which is more of you're dealing with resources and you're, you're reading a whole resource or writing a whole resource where GraphQL is more functional. It's like, hey, give me what I, give me, I'm gonna call a function that's gonna give me back the name of something or the name and some comments or I'm gonna add, append a comment and give the comment text, right? So it's a little bit more function and based. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. I know one of the differences to, um, related to that actually, and this, when I was doing some of the examples kind of got confusing was, if you're doing a query and you have a, you can have a bunch of kind of nested queries, they will run in any order on the server. So they shouldn't have side effects, but it's up to the people writing the queries on the server to make sure that they don't. But with mutations, it's interesting, it actually guarantees that whichever mutation is first will be run first, and then the one after, and then the one after, and then the one after. So mutations are kind of ordered, whereas queries, there's no guarantee about how they're executed on the server. You should also make sure that everything inside of the mutation block is transactional, mm -hmm. which is really nice if you're dealing with like a more rich client, so you can create a post and a user, and if one fails, they'll both fail together. Mm -hmm. yep. Sorry for interrupting. No, it's good, it's good. Sean has actually been writing uh, a lot of GraphQL lately, so he's probably getting with me to some more questions that I can <laughs> Oh, was there anything else that people wanted to know about GraphQL? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that this is not like a, a library or a framework. So I'm wondering like what the implementation for this looks like yeah, uh, so in order to actually set this up so you can use it in the script. Sure. So that was actually a question I thought I would get because there's a, yeah, the first thing you say is like, what do I use for this, right? So there's a, a really good set of libraries actually called Apollo. Here we go. Um, if I can click, yeah. So these guys build a bunch of different things. They build clients for iOS, Android, and the web. Um, they've just released a, a new version, or they're, sorry, they're in beta for a, a new one for the web, which has some interesting features like offline querying and stuff like that. Uh, and they also have servers for Node, and I think, 
Yeah, I think it's just for Node right now. I think they're working on servers for other environments as well. But the nice thing is they write both the front end kind of consumer tool, like the client, as well as the server. So the nice thing there is that you know that they're kind of meant to work together a little bit, which is good. Um, and there are other libraries too. Their uh, Facebook has, for the server, they have uh, Express GraphQL, which is uh, the package that you would use if you wanted to write it. That's the one that's used in a lot of examples on the GraphQL website too. Um, there's another good site called How to GraphQL, I think it is. And yeah, these guys. And so it's cool because they have a little introduction to it, which is kind of covering a bunch of different languages. And then once you have that, they have different stacks that you can use. So they actually have one, I noticed, for Ember and Apollo now too. Um, but they have ones for, uh, for all sorts of different stacks that you might be using to work against. And um, so that would be a good place. You could kind of pick whatever framework you're using and go through those. I don't know if that answers you. your question. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to quickly add a bit to it that uh, there's actually some nice GraphQL as a service mm -hmm. uh, platforms available. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is GraphQL, yeah. uh, which is the most popular, I think. There's also Scaffold. Uh, so those are the two main ones that you can <laughs> use <laughs> right away. <Yeah. laughs> I don't yeah. know the, what the exact web yeah. is, but it's, yeah, it's graph cool, and uh, it doesn't take you much to set it up, and then you can use Apollo on the front end, for example, yeah. and ease the pain of creating these servers, because it's actually, I find it actually harder to uh, maintain and create servers for GraphQL as opposed to REST, mm -hmm. because of the strong typing for the most part. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to mention it. No, you know, it's actually, I was going to, um, in the, the demo, one of the things I was thinking about doing was, was using these guys, because their Playground uh, is one of the services that they offer. It's, it's basically just um, it lets you go and enter queries against a set of data that you define and they host. But it's a really good way to test out some of these and you know, kind of get a sense of what you can do with GraphQL. And they do actually, yeah, they scale right up to if you want to host your app on them. Yeah, there are some other GraphQL service platforms that are up there because RevCool charges pretty wild, mm -hmm. so there there has some free tiers as well. So you can try that. Cool. Okay, any other questions or I guess just comments? Who who here out of curiosity has used GraphQL at this point on that? Okay, so a handful of people, but not too many. Okay, cool. I'm curious to see if that changes over the next year. All right. Well, maybe we'll wrap it there. Thank you very much, guys. All right. Thank you, Mark. Exchange.js is Edmonton's JavaScript meetup. Thanks to our sponsors, Jobber and Investopedia. Support the meetup and like and share this video. And stay informed by following us on Twitter and meetup.com. Links in the description. See you soon!